I became drunk with the beauty and signing rhythm of it, and for a moment I lost myself, actually lost my life. I was set free. I dissolved in the sea, became white sails and flying spray, became beauty and rhythm, became moonlight in the ship and the high, dim, starred sky. The Outer Banks is a 200-mile chain of barrier beaches, islands, lighthouses, at least one lost colony, and one spaceship, all connected by a narrow road protected by sand dunes. But how did this come about? Before 1964, no road, no bridge. If you wanted to live here or visit, you had to drive your car at low tide with the tires deflated and hope for the best. The National Park Service expansion with Roosevelt's New Deal led to the creation of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. The Great Depression led to the creation of the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps, better known as the WPA and CCC, to rebuild the country's infrastructure and put American citizens back to work. Both groups were deployed to Cape Hatteras to erect the dunes and build the road which still remain to this day. This is America's scenic highway, North Carolina Highway 12. The WPA and CCC workers were brought in from all over the country. Most of them slept in army-style barracks and wore uniforms. They battled all manner of elements, extreme weather, mosquitoes, for months on end, with little or no contact from their families. It was a hard life. The completion of the road and the original Bonner Bridge connected the Outer Banks to the mainland and opened the doors so that well over 3 million annual visitors could see a real wilderness beach. While the road did wonders for the mobilization of the area, it also drew a literal line in the sand that is constantly subjected to erosion. Workers and ordinary citizens are on constant watch to keep sand and water from overtaking the road. Most recently, a new bridge was constructed and additional construction is underway to hopefully keep the road open and clear for generations to come. off the coast of Buxton, North Carolina, in an area that ship captains once dubbed the Graveyard of the Atlantic. A 210-foot brick structure stands defiantly in the face of terrible storms and constant erosion, with memories that only she can tell. It is this light that has safely led many a sailor past the deadly Diamond Shoals. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse still stands to this day and is a great source of pride for both the residents and visitors of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. In a country with such a brief history, this is the closest thing we have to the pyramids, or the Parthenon, or the Eiffel Tower. This is American history. From 1803 to 1936, 83 men were designators as keepers of the light. They were lighthouse keepers, and life-saving servicemen. They manned the stations up and down the stairs and up and down the coast during historic storms and times of war. In 1999, the lighthouse was moved approximately 2,900 feet from its original location to protect it from the encroaching tide. These are the stones that made up its original foundation. They were engraved as a memorial to the people that tended to her for so many years. 
This is Dawn Taylor. Many members of her family served as keepers. She has spent the last 20 years researching their lives. Benjamin T. Fulcher was my great, 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 great grandfather. He was assistant keeper at the first Cape Hatteras Lighthouse from 1845 to 1860, a role he held during the Civil War. H.F. Hancock of the Confederate Lighthouse Bureau sent him a letter ordering him to deactivate the light. Reluctantly, he obeyed. Bateman A. Williams was my great-great-great-grandfather. He held the position of second assistant keeper from 1860 to 1865. He too was stationed at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse during the Civil War and most likely also had a struggle with the oath to keep the light burning and the Bureau's order to extinguish it. Saunders Smith was a lighthouse keeper here in 1892. His daughter Melissa, according to a newspaper report, died from falling through the hatch of the lighthouse floor. She slipped and fell, her head striking the iron steps. She sank into the water, gave three piercing screams, and was carried out by the surf, just as her father appeared in the doorway. She was to have been married on Wednesday and had parted with her lover only half an hour before her death. Such events always met with great valor. It is their stories that are here. True inner strength was never on greater display, just like the enduring strength of these stones. The Outer Banks has a long history of terrible storms, nor'easters, and full-blown hurricanes. In a sense, it is these storms that created the landscape, both naturally and industrially, and what make this area so unique from everywhere else. Hurricane Dorian was a storm for the ages, a Cat 1 hurricane that made direct landfall. On Hatteras Island, the damage was substantial, on Ocracoke Island, it was nothing less than devastating. Jason Wells is a lifelong resident of Ocracoke Island and the owner of Jason's restaurant down in the village. He has emerged as an unofficial voice in the cleanup and recovery effort. The damage to his establishment was complete and total. With the massive effort required to clean up and either slow or non-existent federal relief, Getting homes and businesses back to normal could cut into next summer season or even take years. All right, so there are 105 small businesses on Ocracoke. Of those 105 businesses, 88 were flooded. Over 400 of the 1,200 homes on Ocracoke were flooded. And out of the 400 and some that were flooded, um, that's where 70% of the full-time residents live. So basically 70% of Ocracoke full-time residents have been displaced out of their homes uh, because of this. Basically what it boils down to is the five counties in North Carolina that were, that Roy Cooper included in the disaster emergency you know, proposal or whatever, these are all very rural communities, very small communities. So when FEMA decides whether or not to help somebody, it's based upon numbers. 
how many ha- homes were damaged, how many homes were destroyed, how many people were displaced, how many blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I told you that 90% of the businesses on Earthquake got flooded. I told you that 70% of residents were displaced and that a third of the houses in our community were damaged. But FEMA doesn't work off percentages. They work off numbers. Just And so basically we're being penalized for being a small community in essence. Okay. So we have already started the motions to appeal the process. It's very common that FEMA will deny. And then if you appeal it, then you can get denied again, of course, but then sometimes they'll come through. And what we are hoping is that when you go through the appeals process, that they'll look a little bit more into the specifics and details, that they'll look at the percentages and they'll look at, you know, how it's affected. You know, it, basically this, this this has affected 100 percent of the people who live on a You know, and there's houses on Earthquake that have like marks of how high the water got on like the side of their building. Dorian was two feet higher than any other hurricane we've ever had. If your house wasn't destroyed, then your business was. If your business wasn't destroyed, then the place that you work was destroyed. If the place that you work wasn't destroyed, then your mom's house was destroyed. It's just heartbreaking to watch people that you've known for 40 years lose everything they have. Mm -hmm. Even still, when I leave my yard and go down the street, there's just, I mean, piles and piles of people's belongings everywhere. If FEMA doesn't come through, then after the 12 weeks of unemployment, that the state provides when that runs out, then you're, we, you're ineligible to get any other help. If FEMA declared, then we could get 12 more weeks of unemployment, which would get us through till the spring season. Also, FEMA would also help some of the people that were, you know, uninsured and on fixed incomes, like the elderly and stuff would help them rebuild their homes. And again, it's not only because of the, that opens up monetary avenues, it, because it, it releases us from a lot of the bureaucracy and a lot of the um, the you know the hoops you got to jump through in order to get normal assistance. So for those that are watching or listening and they would like to help out, what would be the best course of action for an individual to take? Well, I mean, there's 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 the OBX Foundation, which is ha, had been set up to help, and they're doing an adopt a family program out of that. Okay. Um, through the Life Saving Church. So basically, what that means is you can you can sign up to adopt a family. Um, there the the PTA is um, accepting donations for the class for the classrooms and stuff. The school got flooded out. Mm-hmm. And there's only four classrooms out of the 15 that did not get damaged. So not all of the teachers basically lost all of their supplies in their classrooms. Uh, those two programs are definitely, you know, ones that uh, that are that are have been uh, are going to be very beneficial. But I mean, I would just um, suggest just putting pressure on our our state senators and the governor just to keep, yeah. you know, keep pressure on them to keep pressure on the feds you know, to try to, to make them understand how dire the situation is and how, you know, how dramatically it will affect every single person who lives here. Thank you so much for calling Jason. And uh, I wish you and everyone down there, the, the very best of luck. And just, well, we like, thank like you very said, much. Yeah. Like I said, please, you know, just let us know if there's anything we could do on our end here. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Have a great day. Tucked away in Old Avon Village, Kinnakee Clay is a salty treasure for you to discover. Browse their inspiring gallery, indulge your inner artist with a pottery class, and witness working studios. Here, there is never a dull moment. Whether you're shopping for pottery, wall art, home decor, jewelry, or checking off the gift list, Kinnakee Clay has you covered with their out-of-ordinary collection. Located off the beaten path in Old Avon Village. Take time to seek your treasure.
The Lost Colony has come to take on different meanings. There have been many stories, movies, books, and even a long-running play speculating on the fate of these early settlers. Here's what we know for sure. John White, under the command of Sir Walter Raleigh, sailed 117 men, women, and children across the Atlantic and landed on Roanoke Island. A few months later, Virginia Dare is born as the first child of English parents. Shortly after that, White departs with the intention of returning with more supplies and people to sustain the colony. The Anglo-Spanish War delays his return, and three years later, he returns to find nothing more but the word Croatoan scrawled on a wood post and C-R-O scrawled into a live oak. What does it mean? Croatoan is modern-day Hatteras Island. Not a single one of the 117 men, women, and children were ever accounted for again, including Virginia Dare. What really happened has been up for debate between historians, scholars, hobbyists, and even those looking to capitalize on the sensation of a good myth. This is Scott Dawson. He's the founder of the Croatoan Archaeological Society, and he's devoted his life to researching the Croatoan tribe and the Lost Colony. For me, every little piece of native pottery that we get is precious. Just the two that she found is precious. Even though I know that that pottery has nothing to do with Lost Colony, it's still part of this island's history. And these people are gone, and they're not coming back. The people that made that pottery will never be here again. So you're never going to get any more of it. That's why all of it is kind of sacred. Um, we're on a salvage mission. When we're doing this archaeology, it's, it's very, very apparent in my mind that it won't be here forever. Dr. Mark Horton is a historical archaeologist from the University of Bristol, and he has spent the last several years digging and uncovering artifacts related to the Lost Colony. They have uncovered some new information. Okay, so, so when John White actually came here in 1590, um, he left a instruction to the colonists that if they move to another place they should leave a message carved on a tree um, at the, with the initials or the name of where they had gone to. And when he came to the Roanoke colony he found carved in two places both on the palisade of the fort but also on a oak tree, a, a probably a, a water or live oak tree, the initials CRO. Um, this is very significant because that stands for Croatoan, which is the island that we're here. The reality of it is that there were several voyages to Croatoan before that, and that the English had actually lived on this island before that. And so when they were coming to Croatoan, they were actually coming back to Croatoan, not going to this random place. It's a tribe that they'd had a relationship with and a thriving um, trade and ally for years. And he also left a very specific instruction that underneath the CRO, if there was a cross, then they'd left under duress. But if there was no, no cross, then they would have left under their own, as it were, decision. So, isn't it obvious that the colonists returned to Croatoan, just like they had written? So this would be the perfect place to spot your ships coming back, and it's the perfect place to get away from the enemies that are killing you and it's a perfect place to make sure you're fed something because you have allies. And it is what they wrote down. So it just seems like a logical place to look to me. Why the big mystery? What is so lost about the lost colony? John White, when he returned in 1590, discovered the place empty, literally the door hanging on their hinges, um, the place stripped of everything else. They'd gone away. Um, and John White then returned back to England and started the myth as well that these people um, had disappeared in some way. And when the English came to recolonize North America, Virginia in 1607, the Indians told them that they'd all be massacred and killed. So that's where the story that these people were lost. So did anyone ever try to go back and find the lost colonist? Okay, the heartbreaking part of the whole story is that he, when he coming to try and find his colonists, he sailed past this island of Croatoan. Um, he saw smoke rising from the sand dunes. Uh, he actually took soundings here in the inlet, but he never actually came ashore to check out 
whether they were here or not, because at that point he didn't know that they were, they were going to be living here. He sailed on past, but when he got to Roanoke and discovered that they might be back here in Croatoan, the winds were in the wrong direction, there was a hurricane brewing, and so instead the captain of the ship insisted they sail back to England and not to return back to recover the colonists. And can you imagine the heartbreak that they would have seen, that here was the, the, the ships coming to rescue them, but they just sailed away and left them here. Well, after the 1590s, there's a hundred years in which we hear nothing more of them. But around 1700, a local English traveller by the name of John Lawson came by in the Outer Banks. And he probably never actually came here, but recorded from the Indians that the descendants of the Raleigh colonists were living, still living here on Hatteras Island. That they had fair hair, um, blue eyes, they wore European clothes, and he could say rather curiously that they could speak from a book. Presumably, they could still read and write, um, suggesting that actually the descendants, the descendants of the descendants, were still living here 100 years later. This suggests that the colonists were more abandoned than lost. Is it possible that the English spent generations on Hatteras Island coexisting with the native population? As Dawson notes, there is some evidence of assimilation. Here you've got a different story of assimilation. What we're seeing, you know, lost colony aside, what we're seeing in the 1700s, 1600s, all the way down is complete assimilation. You have Europeans and Native Americans living side by side on an island in harmony for centuries. And that's not found anywhere else in America. It's a shining example of what could have been. Despite all the recent research and interest in the lost colony, there are still more questions than answers. Are these mics on right now? Oh, I don't know. You managed to completely tangle up my thing then, Scott. You are completely useless. Never, never trust the historian to unravel string. Then do it again. Told you I am off kilter today. Totally off kilter. Did any of your people, any of your ancestors work on the dunes? Um, my ancestors actually beat the crap out of those guys. Well, you gotta think, the CCC workers were all guys. And you introduce, uh, you know, however many hundreds of guys on an island and no more girls, it's gonna cause some problems. <laughs> that is just extraordinary. You have a state, nothing visible. Could it just be part of a trade? When, like, it couldn't, trade? it couldn't be highly selected, could it? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I immediately thought, well, it's highly Selassie, but I don't think, that's why I thought it was Ethiopia, but I think it, I could see Greek letters on it. Maybe <laughs> highly Selassie, for God's sake, this is stratified. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> for that one. <laughs> totally hook, line, and bloody sinker. Okay. In 1860, okay. This peat soil right here, if you take it home and spread it out with a rake and spray it down with fresh water and just turn it over and get all the salt off, you can grow anything. That might be some. Not anything. Pretty much. Not if it's something that grows in the desert or something that grows in right. the well, Arctic. You can grow like almost anything. Anything that grows in our climate.